Hi, good evening. My name is Paul Schreiber. I'm a software engineer. I work on 538 and the undefeated. I like to talk about a bunch of things, like talk about hockey. Uh, I like to talk about riding my bike around New York. I like to talk about the concert series I run out of my living room. But today, I'm going to talk to you about HTTPS. So a little while ago, I was on a plane, and I was checking out the 538 website, see what news have been posted, and I noticed there was something unusual about our site. So we have a couple of ads that we sell, you know, how we make money, but there's this other weird ad that we didn't sell at the top of the page. It's strange. Turns out Southwest Airlines decides they're going to put a banner on the top of every web page you visit while you're checking it out on their plane. <laughs> they're not the only people who do this. Sometimes you're using the cable company's free Wi-Fi and they decide to pop up an ad, right, in the middle of your website. And you could get strange ads like this. I bet you the FCC, a government agency, is not trying to sell you shoes, but somebody <laughs> else decides to inject that into their website. It's not just ads that can be injected into your website. Uh, there can be a lot of trackers that can be put on. And I'm not talking about things like cookies, but or analytics tools, but your internet provider can add its own tracking headers. Uh, and those will follow you around the internet. And so if you are on one site, even if you have cookies turned off, uh, the site can grab that header and you know, follow you around as you go to different parts of the internet. There's a nonprofit called Access Now, and they specialize in uh, human rights work involving the internet. They've estimated that 15% of, of sites have these sort of super cookies, uh, these tracking tools that are injected into your network traffic without your knowledge or consent. So, not only, so in addition to putting extra ads on your site and following you around, they can also use your site to attack itself or to attack someone else. So a little while ago, GitHub had some JavaScript that they were running to do a denial of service attack that took them offline for a while. Another thing that you know other folks on your network can do is they can decide to make some money. So Amazon has a great affiliate program. You might have this on your site where people will click on Amazon links and make money. Well, they might decide, you know, I'm your internet provider and I don't want you making that money, I'm going to make the money, so I'm going to rewrite all of your affiliate links to be my affiliate links, and I'm going to make the money. The other thing is, say you're you know, a foreign country, and there are parts of the internet that I don't want you to see, like China or Iran. And so what they've decided is that if you're in Iran and you want to go check out the BBC, that's fine. But if you want to go check out the BBC purchase section, they will block that. So they can block part of the site, but not all of the site. So I'm here to tell you that HTTP is dead. <laughs> it has served us well, but its time has come and gone. You're thinking, okay, that's nice. You're just some weirdo talking to me at a WordPress meeting. Why should I listen to you? Well, the good news is you don't have to listen to just me. You can listen to the Google Chrome engineering team. And what they've said is they're going to mark HTTP as non-secure. Right, so currently in your browser, you can, sites get marked as secure, but if you're visiting a regular site, you don't really know what's going on. So they're going to affirmatively and clearly display that your non-encrypted website provides no data security. And the Firefox team said, yep, good idea. And so they are, they're doing two things. Number one is when they build new features into their browser, they're only going to be available to secure websites. And they're going to take some existing features that you can use on your website today and start turning them off. So if they think that a feature is important, has privacy implications, then it will only be available on a secure website. And not only are the browser makers doing this, but the government is doing this. So last year, the US government executive branch implemented a standard. They said an HTTPS only for all executive branch websites. So all new sites we build must be secure and only secure. And we're going to go and retrofit all the existing websites so they're secure. And part of 
discussion was people say, well, you know, I want to secure any activity that is sensitive in a private. And then you have this long argument and discussion, well, is this website really private? Right? Is this really sensitive? And what they said is, we're just going to settle that argument once and for all. Any web browsing activity is private and sensitive, and therefore we should encrypt everything. So over the past year, we've seen major sites start switching. The Washington Post was the first big news publisher to do this, and they switched uh, last spring. Wired Magazine did this a few weeks, a few months ago, a few weeks ago. Yes, this is in September. Um, BuzzFeed recently did it, so your, your cat quizzes are totally secure. Uh, and then Wikipedia did this a while ago, uh, and they had a long, thoughtful conversation about what it meant, especially because their audience is so diverse. Um, Amazon.com switched. Uh, Yelp switched very recently. So HTTPS is the future of the web. What is the S? Well, the S stands for hope. Hope for a secure internet. <laughs> so what does it mean when I say the things are encrypted? Let's take a quick look. If we have a normal connection between my browser and your web server, it looks like this. Everything is available in plain text, and you can read it, I can read it, and anyone in between us, whether it's our office mate, someone in the coffee shop, our network administrator, they can see what's going on. But when we have an encrypted connection to the website, everything is scrambled, and nobody else can see what's happening. And now they can't see it, they can't change it, they can't track it. So, librarians have long been the guardians of, of free speech uh, and privacy. You know, if you go to a the library, they're going to take what books you take out of the library as confidential and protect that very seriously. So if you're running a website, you should treat your visitors in the same way. What pages they visited is no one else's business but yours and theirs. A secure website will provide you with it will help guarantee the integrity of the page. So it says that the page that I sent is the page that you're going to read hasn't been altered in transit. It will protect the privacy. So when you go to a secure website, you cannot, other people can't see what page you're seeing. They know either the name of the site, but that is it. And another thing about secure websites is that it will make things faster. I think that's kind of odd. I've been using the internet for a long time. And one of the big reasons I didn't build a secure website was because it slowed things down. Well, that was true back in the day. But now, the opposite is true. When you get a secure site, it's more likely to result in a speed up for you and your content and your readers. So we have there are two sort of sets of incentives going on here to encourage you, as a website creator, to make your site secure. So the carrot approach and the stick approach. This is the carrot approach. So the browser makers are saying, if you build a secure website, we're going to give you access to all kinds of really powerful web features that you can make great applications with. One of them is location services. So if you want to know where in the world somebody is, you need to be using a secure site. If you want to pop up notifications to alert them of new news or changes, you need a secure website. If you want to use the microphone, if you want to use the video camera, if you want to go full screen, if you want to know about rotation, if you want to use the device landscape or portrait, if you want to use the accelerometer, if you want to use the application cache, if you want to be able to hide the cursor, all of these great features which help you build powerful web applications are only going to be available on a secure website. And then lastly, HTTP 2.0. HTTP 1.1 has been around a long time. The new version is much, much faster. But HTTP 2.0 is only available under HTTPS. So you want to get the speed up, you've got to switch to a secure set. The second thing is the stick approach. The browser makers are going to start warning readers that the site they're on is not secure. So this is what it looks like today. If you're on a non-secure site, you might see a little document. If you're on a secure site, you'll see the nice green lock, and we, we've been seeing that for years. But this, as the, we talked about earlier, this doesn't really tell you anything about the non-secure site. Then you, you see it sort of looks neutral, but it's not really neutral. It's really a site that offers no privacy protection. And so starting in 
Chrome later this year, you're going to see warnings like this. So you will say secure and not secure. So your site will have big red triangle warning readers that your site is not secure. And people might start calling you up and say, your site's not secure, what's going on? You don't want to have that problem. So you want to encrypt your site before people start seeing this. So we're going to talk about five different parts here. We're going to talk about certificates, what they are, how you get one, why they're important. We'll talk about configuring your server to use these certificates. We'll talk about the content on your website and how to make it work when your site's secure. We'll talk about money, does this cost anything? And then we'll go through some troubles that you might run into and problems and how you would solve them. So let's talk about certificates first. A certificate is a document that says, I am who I say I am. So if I have a certificate for 538, the website where I work, that when your web browser talks to me, you know that you're talking to me and not somebody pretending to be me. Certificates uh, are cryptographically signed in a way uh, so to, the, that way the browser can tell they haven't been tampered with. And there is an old method of signing them called SHA-1. And you pretty much can't buy a SHA-1 certificate these days, uh, but if you, if you have an old certificate that's been around for a few years, your browser will start warning you about it, and it's a good time to stop, take a break, and replace it with a certificate that has SHA-2 or SHA-256. Now, when I, I've been giving this talk for a while, I used to have this whole long section on how you could shop for certificates, because there were so many different certificate vendors. It's kind of like buying a car. There were lots of different models and lots of different prices. Sometimes the same company owned a lot of different brands, and there was they all mostly did the same thing, but you could pay a lot more a lot less. The good news is you don't really need to worry about that anymore. As of last December, Let's Encrypt provides certificates for free to anyone and to everyone. These certificates are the same quality. They're just as secure as the certificate you could pay 10 or 100 or 500 dollars for. And you can get them instantly. And you can get them for one domain or as many domains as you want. This is a, prof, a project of the nonprofit Internet Security Research Group, which is sponsored by folks like the Electronic Frontier Foundation and Mozilla. So let's talk about setting up your server. So if you run your own server and you have a certificate, you have to do some configuration. In the cryptographers, they have a saying, which is friends don't let friends write their own crypto. Because you're probably gonna, it's really hard, you're probably gonna do it wrong. I have a similar saying, friends don't let their friends configure their own security settings on their web server. Uh, the good news is you don't have to. There are a couple of great tools out there that will help you. There is a tool called SSLmate. It's a command line tool, so if you have Linux or another Unix variant, you can download and install this. It will let you buy certificates from them, which you can do, but now that Let's Encrypt is out, you don't need to, but their make config command is super handy, and it will tell you what to put in your Apache or your Nginx server uh, to make sure you get everything right. But the other way to do this is Mozilla has a great website and it is the SSL config generator. It knows about not only different server software but different versions of different server software. So if you have Apache 2.2, it will give you the right configuration for that. Apache 2.4 and all these slides are going to get put online so you don't have to write down all these URLs. Uh, now, if you are running a WordPress website and you aren't managing the server yourself, there is a great WordPress plugin called WP Encrypt. It uses, it talks to Let's Encrypt directly and it will download and install the certificates for you. And then your internet provider can just update its configuration and you'll manage the certificates. The good news is over the last year since Let's Encrypt has come out of beta, many internet providers started supporting it for, which means you'll get HTTPS for free when you buy a package from someone like DreamHost or WP Engine. And a lot of other providers who offer services have started to use it to manage tons of domain names. So if you have a bit.ly, short links, that's backed by Let's Encrypt. Shopify, if you're selling products, their certificates come from Let's Encrypt. WordPress.com, Let's Encrypt. Rackspace, HubSpot, OVH, which is a huge cloud provider in Europe. So Let's Encrypt is not just something you can use for your personal website, but it's something that big corporations are saying, this is secure enough for us. 
Right, so now you've got your certificate and you've configured your server, you want to turn security on. You want to turn on, make your site encrypted. What does that mean? Well, there's four steps. The first step is you turn HTTPS on. That means you have a secure version of your site and a non-secure version of your site. And you can go to whichever one you want, if you type HTTP or you type HTTPS. And then once you've tested that out for a while and you know that it's working, you start switching it to, to HTTPS by default. So if someone types in HTTP, they will get redirected to the secure version of your site. And this is pretty good, but it's not totally foolproof because someone can still catch that initial request and redirect you somewhere else. And so that might be you know, an internet provider or a coffee shop or so on. And the way you avoid that problem is with something called HSTS, and that stands for Hypertext Strict Transport Security. What that does, it's a message, it's a header you send to the browser that says, when you go to my site, always get the secure version of my site, even if the user forgot to type the S or clicked on a link without the S. So if I type in HTTP colon slash slash paulschreiber.com, it will redirect you to the secure version no matter what. And once that's working and you're sure your site is ready to stay secure, you can submit it to the HSTS preload list. And this is a list that browser makers build into the browser. So Firefox, Chrome, Internet Explorer, Safari all have a copy of this list. And that means the, even the first time you go to a site, if you've never been there before, you will always get the secure version. And if you get one of those certificate warnings, sometimes you, when you go to a coffee shop or you're visiting someone's work network and they make you go click through some sort of agreement. Uh, and it won't let you accidentally click through one of those to get to your site, uh, which means somebody can't be tricked to visiting a fake version of your site. All right, now on to content. Uh, a lot of the content you create is your own, but many of the things that you include on your websites, on your blogs, are from other places on the internet. And traditionally, this has been a big pain point in switching to HTTPS, because you not only do you have to be secure, but all the stuff you depended on had to be secure. But the good news is that almost everything you want to use has, and embed is already available as secure content. So if you're looking at videos, like from Vimeo or YouTube or Vine, if you're looking at pictures from Instagram, if you're looking at PDFs from Document Cloud or Scripty, all these are available as secure embeds. And in, over the last year, a bunch of major content providers have started providing things securely. So the New York Times and NPR and Major League Baseball, they have videos and audio files for you to embed. Those are now HTTPS. If you are using, if you have comments on your website, if they're from Facebook, or discuss, those are available as HTTPS. A big stumbling block has traditionally been ads, but both major ad networks like DoubleClick and Outbrain, they support HTTPS. And social content. So if you have plugins from Facebook or Twitter or even Google+, those are all secure. If your site uses analytics or A-B testing tools, all of those tools from Optimizely, from Comscore, from Omniture, from Chartbeat, and so on, those are available on HTTPS. What about content delivery networks? What if you run a big site and you don't want to, you don't, you have assets like images and movies and fonts on another server or a collection of servers? The good news is major CDNs support HTTPS today and with many of them you don't have to pay extra for it. So if you have Amazon's Cloud Front, or if you have Cloud Flare, uh, those give you HTTPS for free. Um, if you have Fastly, they're going to charge you more. If you have Akamai, which you would probably only have if you're a large company and you had sort of an enterprise sales relationship with them, then you would uh, have to re sort of renegotiate your contract with them um, to say, hey, we need a secure site. Now, good fonts are another area where there shouldn't be any problem. All of the major web font foundries and free fonts like Google Fonts are available over HTTPS. So all you need to do for any of these types of pieces of content is to update your existing URLs, probably put an S on the end, all right, at the end of the protocol. All right, what about money? Well, the good news is certificates no longer cost anything. So you can wipe that part out of your budget. 
network connection CDNs, most of the time, you won't have to pay something else for that. You will have to spend a little bit of person time updating the configuration on your server and keeping that up to date. So when, the new, when there are new recommended security ciphers you need to use or other changes you need to make to keep, to keep up with any vulnerabilities out on the internet, you know, that'll take a little bit of your time from time to time. And if you run a blog or a news website where you have staff who embed content and link to things on the internet, you'll need to spend a little bit of time training them to make sure they get the secure version of the site, of, of the embed, because non-secure embeds won't work on secure sites. All right, now what about problems? You know, what happens when you move your site to HTTPS? What kind of things are you gonna run into? Well, there's two areas of problems. There's the warnings and the errors. The warnings, when you see one of them, your site will continue to work as you expect. But if you see an error, that means some piece of the behavior will have changed. It won't look or act in the way you'd expect, and that's something you need to address right away. The main type of problem you have is with mixed content, and that's when you have a secure page, and you have an image, a video, an iframe, a piece of JavaScript, a font, any Thing you could include in your web page that's not secure. Now, if this type of content is considered passive or safe by your web browser, you just get a warning. So, if you have an image, for example, or an audio file, it will load that and it will play it, and you'll see a little yellow triangle, you'll see warnings in the console, and it will continue to go on. But if you have active content, things like JavaScript, things that could be, that could run code, that could alter the behavior, your browser will refuse to run this non-secure active content. You'll get a red warning error, so probably an X or a red triangle, and your, some of the behavior in your site will have been disabled. Now, if you have lots and lots of pages, going through them all could take a long time, and you don't want to do this one at a time. So there's a great tool out there called Mixed Content Scan. You give it the URL of your website, it will go through page by page for you, and it will pre or prepare a report telling you which pages have mixed content and what the mixed content is, so you can go ahead and fix it. Now, an even better piece of news is there's something called a content security policy. Content security policy is another type of header, and there are lots of different content security policies that do many things, but we're only gonna talk about two of them today, because you could give an entire talk just on content security policies. But one of them is called upgrading and secure requests. What that means is that if you have a secure web page and it's got some insecure images in it, it says, hey browser, you know those HTTPs in the middle of my page? Just pretend there's an S there and rewrite them transparently for the reader so I don't have to go through my thousands of old website pages and fix them one at a time because I'm busy. Great, that helps a lot. Uh, it's supported in current versions of Chrome and Firefox and I think Safari as well. You'll, if you, if this is a concern for you, something you're gonna do, you should check on where your users are coming from and make sure enough of them are, support this. And the second piece of content security policy we're gonna talk to you about is what is called report only. So you can send a little header to your readers, to your users, that says, if you run into one of these mixed content errors, send a report to me, to my server, or to a third-party service that I'm using, and then I'll get a list of aggregate warnings, and then I can know which pages to fix, because I'll see like 700 people went to this page and they all hit this error, I better fix that first. And you can go ahead and run this yourself, or you can use a service like reporturi.io. One important thing to know is the idea of a protocol relative URL. This was a, considered a good idea for a while, but it's now considered an anti-pattern. So if you have code that looks like this, where you have something that starts with two slashes instead of HTTP colon slash slash or HTTPS colon slash slash, you should change it to use HTTPS. Even if you haven't switched your site to a secure site, you can still load your JavaScript, your images, your fonts, all these things over a secure URL. And that means when you eventually do switch, it will be easier because there's less work for you. The only exception to this is iframes. If you have an, a non-secure site, 
uh, you want to have a non-secure iframe if you need the iframe to talk to the site. Because okay. for iframes to talk to the pages in which they're embedded, the protocols have to match. All right, you say, well, I've now gone through my site and I've upgraded it as much of my own content and all my Facebook comments are working and all my Instagram pictures are working. But I've run into some other areas where the content isn't yet secure. What do you do? Well, the good news is a lot of time you can just ask. We had a few different services we used, like placehold.it, which is for placeholder images, or SoundSite, which is a great tool for embedding clip it, clips of audio content. And one of the Outbrain tools didn't yet support HTTPS when we started using it. And we asked them, and sometimes it took a day, and sometimes it took a couple of months, but they got around to it. Uh, if you're using Akamai, sometimes you can just rewrite the Akamai URLs, and you can move it in, so your host name inside there, and go ahead and do that while you're waiting. Now, taking a look at mixed content, there's a great tool to help you diagnose this, it's called HTTPS Everywhere. It's a browser extension. It's designed to make your experience as a user, as a reader, more secure. But one of the great side benefits is it helps you as a web developer, because it will tell you which parts of the page you're on aren't secure, and it will follow all the redirects to help you trace that down, which can be really tricky. Lastly, I'm gonna tell you about a whole set of tools that are useful to you as a website builder and as a web developer when you're building HTTPS. The first one is a browser extension called More TLS Analyzer. It's spelled funny, because uh, that's an internet joke. Uh, and it will go and look at your page and figure out what things are secure, what things are not secure. I mentioned HTTPS everywhere. The good news is Chrome has started to build in a lot of this functionality into new versions of Chrome. If you look in the developer tools, there is now a security panel. If you go to a secure site that looks like this, it's green, you've got a lock, it looks good certificate. If you go to a page with no encryption at all, you get the little document, it says it's not secure, you get a bunch of yellow warnings. If you go to a page here with a bad certificate, so remember I talked about SHA-1 certificates? If this certificate expires this year, you'll get a yellow warning. If you have a SHA-1 certificate that expires next year or later, it will give you a red error. Um, so here you see it's not secure. The certificate for the site expires in 2016. The certificate chain contains a signing, a certificate signed using SHA-1. So it's warning, it's like, uh, it's not good. Because that, that could be uh, spoofed cryptographically. I thought this was kind of ironic. <laughs> uh, the, there's a great, site called badssl.com, which has lots of incorrectly configured uh, domain, domain subdomains with different test pages, so you can see what things look like, whether there's mixed content, whether there's expired certificates, whether there's host name mismatches. So if you want to see what a user would see when they ran into these, you can go check out their tools. And so this is an example of a page with mixed content. And you see down at the bottom, it says, this site includes HTTP resources, view one request and network panel. And then this is a site which says blocked mixed content. So the other site might have had a, an image that was not secure, because this one might have a JavaScript that's not secure. And so it's not being run at all. This next tool is SSL Labs SSL test. So it will look at your server, and it will see how well you've configured SSL. Do you have the right uh, encryption methods, uh, do you have the right set of key exchange, do you, are you vulnerable to any known flaws like Heartbeat or Poodle or Beast? And they update this frequently, so you should check back regularly because you might have an A today, but then some new security flaw comes out and you haven't patched it to fix it, so you might get downgraded to a B or a D or an F. So come back regularly, check it out. Is it, well, the Mozilla folks have another tool or collection of tools called the Observatory and it will run through many different types of reports which you can also use. It's a really tough grader, don't feel bad if you get a bad score. It's really hard to get a really good score on this one, and there's so many of them. Um, I talked about the preload list, so when you have your site working on HTTPS and HSTS, this is where you can uh, submit it. So it will go in the browsers, 
And I mentioned badssl.com, so this is a great place to see what it's like when incorrectly configured or other types of bad content are like. Um, securityheaders.io is another tool that will analyze your site and give you a really mean score about how bad you're doing. Mm -hmm. Reportyouri.io is a service for, for collecting those content security policy reports. So if you don't want to set up your own server to do it, which you probably don't need to bother doing, you can get an account there and have all your reports go there and you can see how your site's doing. There's a site called cspisawesome.com, and that CSP is Content Security Policy. So if you want to learn all about content security policies and figure out how to make one for your site, you can go here. Uh, HTTPS Watch looks at the top sites on the internet and sees how many of them support HTTPS. So banks, news sites, social networks, all these things, they're tracking them and saying how many of them are secure and how, how sort of many of the security boxes they checked. Google does something similar. They have what they call a transparency report for top sites on the internet, and how many of them are using HTTPS, how many of them are using modern cryptography, and so on. So good news is, once you do have a secure site, and you fly on an airplane, Southwest can no longer inject ads into your page. You see the experience that you, as the creator of the site, intended. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions you have. All right. Hi. Hi. Very good. Thank you. What's um, your name? Mm -hmm. Sorry. What's your name? My name's Andy. Andy. Hi. Hi. Um, you said the browser is going to be warning us in the next few. Do we have a date? Is it 2017? Is it this year or? So I have. I'm running the beta version of Chrome, which is Chrome 55, uh, which I guess gets into the regular release channel in the next month or two. So probably December or January. And that's doing so. The, the so that's when you get the secure and yeah. non-secure uh, warnings in your address bar. And I'm not sure what Firefox's schedule is off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hi. Hi, my name is Bud, and I, hi, have, Bud. A, I have a question about the um, the speed at which certificates can be issued. Yes. How is that possible? How is what possible? Well, you say like in a second you can have a certificate issued. Yeah, well, not they one second. Verify that you are who you are. Sure. Uh, so it's not usually one second, it's usually about 15 seconds. Uh, but so, which is important. Yeah, but the way it works is typically the way ver verification used to work is they send you an email, and the email will contain a code, and you have to click on a link and type in the code. And that was slow and annoying because it was a manual process, and you know, it'll go in your spam folder or get lost, or so some won't work. But the other way they do this is that they will just verify that you have access to that domain name. So, for example, I control paulschreiber.com, and I want a certificate for it. And they would say, hey, paulschreiber.com, you know, try to reach you, and then it would try to, and it would listen for the Let's Encrypt client, which is called CertBot. And if it could talk to CertBot there, and it would say, yep, you really do have control over that website, okay, we'll give you a certificate for it. Uh, there are, the, there's a couple of other types. So the certificates, let, let's encrypt is, issues, and the types of certificates that most people have are what are called DV or domain validated certificates, and they require you to control that website, right? Um, there's two other types. There's something called OV or organization validated, where they do some checking on the name of the organization behind the certificate, and you almost never see that. The one that you do see sometimes are EV certificates or extended validation. When you see a green bar at the, in the address bar, you'll see that a lot with banks or um, the Washington Post did it on their site where it'll say the name of the site uh, or the name of the company. So say like the Washington Post Corporation. Uh, and those cost money. Um, you from, there's very little reason to, to get one of those for most people. Um, and those take longer time period because somebody has to go and look up your company and prove that you're really you and you are, and you're not just the guy in the mail room trying to get a certificate, but you actually have like authority to make orders on how you have the company and so on. Uh, so yeah, so the ways that it's quick is because they can do it server to server, it doesn't require a human to click on a thing anymore, um, and the type of validation that's required only is that you can manage that website. Hi. Hi. Uh, one, could you run a small to medium store with one of these free certificates? Yes, you could run a large store with one of these free certificates. Okay. And then another question, um, if you, like I teach, and I'll give my 
students free add-on accounts to my website. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that work with the? Well, when you say you give them add-on accounts, do they get their own domain names or subdomains or what? Yes. Yes, to, to which one? Uh, they get uh, uh, add-on domains. Well, so like, are you like blah.com and they get like my name dot blah dot com? Is that what you're saying? Yes, but they can also have their own. It can also forward to a unique. So Let's Encrypt certificates lets you have multiple domains on the same certificate. It's not a wildcard certificate, so it doesn't let you have unlimited subdomains by default. So for example, again, if you wanted to have www.blah and you know, mail.blah and you know, testdata.blah and so on, you can do all of those. But if you had a wildcard, you'd get them all for free. So here you have to enumerate them all. You have to know the names of all of the ones you're going to use in advance. And you can also get different domains on the same certificate. So if you have, you know, uh, WordPressFan.org and New York City Dancer.biz, you can put them on the same certificate with Let's Encrypt still for free. That type of certificate is called a SAN certificate. The SAN means subject alternative name. It's what lets you put multiple domains on the same certificate. And, and so sometimes if you go to a provider like Fastly and you click on the little certificate icon in Chrome. And you'll see like totally unrelated businesses. Like you'll look at the projects.538.com and it'll have some other company's certificate because they're a CDN and they have a lot of customers using the same server. Um, and that's not because something bad has happened. That's how these certificates are supposed to work. Hi. Hi, Freddie. Hi, um, Freddie. You mentioned that the HTTPS is fast. Yeah. Like, can you elaborate a little more on that? Sure. So this is because of HTTP 2.0. HTTP 2.0 changes the way connections work between the browser and the server. It lets browsers keep connections open longer uh, and so send multiple requests. Because a lot of the slowdown comes from, I need to get an image from you. Hey, can I have an image? Yes. Then I tear that connection down. Hey, can I have the next image? Yes. Can I have a font? Yes. Whereas this lets you keep one. Give me the image. Give me the font. And so on. Uh, it's sort of a very simplified version of that. Uh, but, and the browser makers have said, if you want to get this new HTTP 2.0, which is a lot faster, you have to use HTTPS. So that's how they're faster. The other reason that they're not, is you don't have the slowdowns you used to have, is because computers are so much more powerful than they were eight years ago. And so the encryption used to take time. And, but, you know, how, if computers double, you know, the number of transistors doubles or the speed doubles every 18 months over eight years, that's a lot of doubling. So the, like, the number of milliseconds or nanoseconds to the encryption has shrunk, um, and there's been you know advances in software as well uh, to reduce the number of chips you need to make and um, reduce the number of requests and so on. So the main reason they're faster is because of HTTP 2.0, um, and the other reason the, the, the sort of for the you don't have they aren't the reason they aren't slower is because computers got so much better. I had two other hands. Did that answer your question? Yes. Sir. Okay. Two other hands. Yeah, Ron. Hi, Ron. Um, so I noticed that uh, 538 is still in testing mode on WordPress VIP. I also use WordPress VIP. Wondering yeah. if, uh, first of all, did you notice apples to apples if there was performance uh, improvement? Second of all, any reason why you guys are still in testing mode? Any tips so, specifically with dealing with uh, WordPress VIP? Sure. So I haven't noticed, I haven't done extensive testing on it. Um, it seems to be a little faster because of H you get HTTP 2.0. The reason we haven't switched is because our ad ops team hasn't finished switching all the ads. Um, so if you go to the secure version of the site, it'll work. Sometimes some of the ads don't work. Whether that's a bug or a feature is up to you. Um, uh, and we're so hopefully later this year we will be, they will have everything finished and we'll switch that on by default. Um, is there a third part or that's it? That was great. Great. Hey, uh, David here. Hi, David here. Uh, uh, so. When I used to look for SSL certificates in the past, there the premium ones was the five hundred dollars plus. Yeah. They say we're going to cover X amount of money if yeah. something goes horribly wrong. Honestly, you never really knew what that meant because I, I tried to yeah. e-commerce stuff. Uh, but it, is that what still makes uh, those expensive SSL certificates viable? Uh, so I, I I am not a lawyer and I'm not an insurance person. Um, I don't know anyone who's ever used any of the, made a claim on any of these policies, uh, either successfully or unsuccessfully. Uh, I, and I'm not sure, you know, which, under what theory of liability the certificate vendor is at fault. Uh, and so, 
it seems like the risk is pretty low and, um, of getting and not getting a certificate from them, and and the reward, you know, of like saving five hundred dollars is pretty high. Uh, and like when you buy, I have a bike lock. Uh, and sometimes the bike locks are like, you know, a thousand dollar guarantee if they steal your bike, and they're like, but you must have, pers you have to give them the old lock, and they're like, well, they stole that too. You're like, oh, well, I guess that claims no good. So I'm skeptical of these, but I don't have specific experiences either personally or, or stories to tell you whether it worked or not. Uh, I can ask more. You may. Uh, so if I wanted to manage a lot of these SSLs and auto renew, yes. Let's say I manage. Like yeah. Maybe thousands. Yeah. Is there tools out there that help me manage that already, or do I kind of make my own scripts? And so, if, if the answer was six months ago, it would have been making your own scripts. But the new version of the Let's Encrypt tool, which is called Certbot, has that built in. So you just type Certbot Renew, and it will go through all of your hundred certificates, figure out which one of them, which ones are near expiry. So if it's within a few days, it will renew them for you. It won't touch the other ones. So you can have that run uh, as a cron job. Like every day or every week or however often you want. Perfect. Thank you. And then you just, it, if you have a server that needs to be restarted, you can have that be from your script. Steve. Hi, I'm Steve. Um, sorry. Uh, can you talk a little more about HSTS, how important it is, types of headers you can load, and also, is there some issue with the initial page load on HSTS? Sure. So HSTS uh, is very helpful because it, it ensures that you always go to the secure version of your site, uh, even if you don't type the S in or if you click on a link that doesn't have the S. Uh, it means if it's on the if it's preloaded, so if it's you've ed put it in the browser preload list, it means even the first time a reader goes to your site, they will get the secure version. Whereas without the preload list, once it's been there once, it knows to always go back to the secure version. It also it prevents you from clicking through people from clicking through those certificate warnings. Right, that Chrome puts up saying, "Well, this doesn't look like it's actually, you know, Steve's. So let's look, you know, Steve.com." Uh, and uh, you avoid the problem of your first visit to the site being possibly intercepted or being located. So that preload list. That so is the preload list is a, is. Is helpful. It's a what you want, but you want to make sure you have to be careful with the preload list. You don't want to put yourself on the preload list and then take and decide, oh no, something is wrong. I need to take HTTPS off for a day because all the people who will go to your site will get the secure version, and they won't be able to go to the non-secure version. So you should only you should only do that once you're sure that it works. Um, now, if you screw up and you really need to, you can like write a note to the browser vendor, being like, please remove me. I'm really sorry. Please, please. And they'll be like, okay, fine. Um, but in order for you to get on the preload list, you one, you have to configure the HSTS header on your server, and you have to add the preload keyword to it, and then you have to go to the preload site and click submit. If you click submit and you don't have HSTS, you don't have the preload keyword in the HSTS header, then it won't, it'll say, sorry, I can't add you. So I, I can't go around adding your site, because say you don't have the preload header, uh, preload keyword, and you don't have the header on it, it'll try to go there and say, oh yeah, no, this is not set up. So you can't just go around messing with people by adding them to the preload list. <laughs> Hi. Oh, hi, Randy. Hi, um, Randy. You, being an early adopter uh, with the uh, SSL certification, will that help uh, search engine rankings with Google in the eyes of search engines? That's a great question. The answer is yes. Google has said that they treat HTTPS, so secure sites, as one of the signals to increase the authority uh, of a site. So as all things being equal, a secure version of the site will rank higher than a non-secure version of the same site. And the things to remember um, are, if you're transitioning, you want to make sure that you put the permanent redirects in so they aren't going to the old version of your site that's not secure. If you have link tags that are rel equals canonical, you want to make sure that they point at the secure version because you don't want to have the, the canonical version be the HTTP version, but you're sending them the HTTPS version. If you're giving Google mixed signals, it, you know, it will say, well, I don't think they're right. this is quite right, and you won't get that sort of boost. So make sure when you transition it, it properly, um, and that you put permanent redirects in, you switch the canonical tags, uh, and you switch, you, try, you want to switch it ever as much as you can at once um, to avoid this sort of weird lag problem where it's 
Okay. And the other thing is Google Webmaster Central. You want to look in there and make sure the secure version is added separately to Google Webmaster Central so you can see that as well. Okay, we had another hand. So, so in terms of the redirects, if you have an ISAP file or you have IIS redirect, so does that mean you should go through all those file, all those lines and make sure everything is HTTPS? So the, the, the what redirects I'm talking about are when you redirect from HTTP to HTTPS. Right? You will have you want to make sure that there are 301, which is a permanent redirect, and not 302 or some other type of temporary redirect. Because that way Google knows to crawl the secure version. Uh, if you have a bunch of redirects that are set up manually, you, it, it would be great to upgrade them to HTTPS so you won't get redirected twice. So like, so you go from page A to page B and then you have to go from page B to the secure version of page B. Right? This way you go from A to the secure version of B right away. And you're saving the, the browser an extra request and speeds up the page load a little bit. That's only if you have HTTP there. If it's, if it's relative then, Worry. Yes, if it's if you uh, are you have rel however your redirect tool is configured to only include relative URLs, that's probably not something you have to update. If I may, yeah. Um, if, if you're using, for example, Rackspace mm -hmm. as your hosting company, uh, can you just tell them, hey, I, I, I'd like to for you guys to put me on secure. So I haven't used Rackspace personally, but they I read well, I recently because I had their logo up because someone they recently started supporting Let's Encrypt. So you should be able to go to them and say, I want to switch to a secure site. Um, you some of them may have this as a checkbox in their control panel or their UI where you say make my site secure. Uh, and then you don't have to talk to them. Some of them might not have it that automated yet where you have to call or email and say, please turn this on for me. But Yes, uh, for sites, for providers like Rackspace and DreamHost and WP Engine that support it, um, you you should go. You can go ahead and ask them to turn it on, whether it's something to yourself or having a support request. Yeah. So as a, a, a creator of a page, yes. Do I need to worry about anything? Is, if I set secure, do I need to worry about me doing something on that HTML page or a .NET page or whatever? Well, what, you, what, what worry about what sorts of well, things? Well, I mean, is there, that's what I'm asking, is there something that I need to do well, creating? If I, when you're if creating I do absolute links, then I do absolute. So if you're creating a page, you want to worry You want to worry about content that you're embedding. So if you're embedding images or iframes or pictures, fonts, you want to make sure that they're secure. Um, and if you're linking to other sites and they have secure versions, it's good to link to the secure versions. If you're linking internally, you probably are just using a relative URL anyway, so you don't have to change that. What if you're using old YouTube videos? Do you have to go back and change those? Yeah, so if you have a YouTube video and the embed code doesn't have an HTTPS, it just has an HTTP, you just have to stick the S on there. And if they're really old, you might want to update the URL to use uh, their new iframe, so like youtube.com slash embed slash whatever the code is, uh, because that way it'll be sort of future proof and we'll use the current version that's working best. So yeah, YouTube videos are definitely something that you need to be using the secure version of on a secure page. Thank you, uh, Andy. Andy. Hi. Andy. Um, when you've got the two of the line third, you've got the you've just about to go live with the site. You've got the HTTPS and the HTTP. Yeah. Is there a go-to WordPress plugin that you can recommend or anybody that can do that redirect for you, so you don't have to? So I don't usually do that redirection from within WordPress. I usually do it from the web server, like with Apache or Nginx. Uh, and have set up the redirect rules there. Okay. So I can't recommend specific WordPress plugins. If you set the site URL, um, they like in, in WordPress settings yes. in general, like there's two places where you put the URL, and you can put an HTTPS there as well, which is good, and that will help force it. But uh, if you want HSTS, you want the server forcing the redirects, you should make sure you're doing it in both places. And not if you're on shared hosting and you haven't got access to that. Well, yeah, so. you'll have to ask your host to set okay. that up as well. And then, is that, does that look after the H HSTS? Plan? No, the HSTS is, is separate. Again, that's something you want the host to configure for you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Steve. Hi, we actually have a couple of good HSTS redirection plugins. Oh. Are you going to pass plate for that? Yeah, we're going to handle that for you, but if you want to share, host, 
There's a couple of good ones. Just type in you know, building WordPress.org. So it's good for that really. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, but it, again, if, if your host can do it for you, um, have them do that, and then it's one last plugin you have to worry about. Well, any more questions? Excellent. Thank you so much for all the great questions.